Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am Grant Whitney. I'm the treasurer of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. Uh, to those of you who have been to our previous webinars, thanks for coming back. And for any first timers, welcome. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, Brian Train, who's going to be um, giving us a presentation on game design and, and self publication. Um, so I won't do the disservice of trying to introduce Brian and who he is in just a sentence. So I'll kind of let that, um, let him have that honor. Uh, so I'll just kind of a quick run through of kind of how this is going to go. Um, so uh, in just a moment or two, I'll hand it off to Brian. Uh, we do ask that everyone turn off your, apart from Brian, of course, uh, your microphone and video, uh, just kind of less, uh, audio and, and visual stimulation. And sometimes we encounter some lag when we do. Um, so uh, Brian will have a presentation. I'll be sharing that. And um, if you do have uh, questions or comments, feel free to toss them in the chat below. Um, what I'll do, I'll log the questions, kind of group them together. Uh, and then we'll do kind of a, a Q and A at, at the end. Um, and if you have any other questions that pop in your mind, feel free to add them. Um, I think that's all I got. So uh, without further ado, uh, Brian, I should, you should be able to um, uh, share your screen. Let me know if you can't, but uh, yeah, I will hand it off to you. Okay, well, <clears throat> maybe unmuting me is a bad, bad idea. Oh. We have video. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm just going to get right into the slides, and um, we'll just uh, I'll just hit the share screen thing here. And let's begin. So. In our short time together today, I'm going to talk about the self-publishing route for your game designs, assuming that you know you have a game or you want to design a game and distribute it. We'll go over why you should do this, what kind of things you can create on your home computer, and how you can publish and distribute these things. So um, I'd like to remind you that my slide deck will be available for my website, um, so no need to scribble everything down or take any notes. Um, here's the URL. Uh, at the bottom there uh, on the slide. Also, it's on the last slide of this deck. So if you scribble anything down, scribble that down. And later I will also put this URL in the chat window. Um, as Grant said, I'd also like to hold questions until after I finish the deck. Um, if you do have a question, type it in the chat window and we can come back to it later uh, because I might have actually answered your, your question in the course of the presentation. So I am Brian Train, defiler of paper. I have been playing war games since about 1979. I've been designing them <clears throat> for about the last 30 years. And you can see that I published with a pretty wide variety of, uh, of uh, small press uh, outfits mostly. And uh, my special interests in game design, if you know my work at all, are in lie in irregular warfare, political military games, and just uh, games that have uh, asymmetry in their design somehow. Now, everybody here, is interested in at least playing games, if not in designing their own. And if you've never done this, everything that goes into a game may not appear obvious or logical or needed. So just how does the designer make everything work together or not? This is a substantial problem with computer games, which everyone here has playing. Uh, the rules are uh, generally opaque. The presentation you know, it's, is often fixed and the rules are immutable. So James Dunnigan, a man who many of you have heard of, if you haven't, if you haven't uh, actually had the fortune to meet him yourself, is the man who contributed most to the early structure and the appeal of board wargaming. And he called this the black box syndrome. And Dunnigan also said about manual games in particular, if you can play them, you can design them. Now, by this he meant that playing a manual game brings its players into very intimate contact with the game's design and mechanics, expressed through its rules. When you play it, you can't help but understand its structure, logic, and intent. And more importantly, how all of those things can be changed to suit your own purposes and inclinations. Uh, we all start as players. Some of us end up as designers. 
Now, I'm not going to talk much more about the hows and wherefores of designing games themselves beyond repeating uh, Dunnigan's encouragement. You know, really, you can do it. I've published somewhere over 50 titles in the course of my career, and uh, it didn't hurt at all. I'm going to leave this, though, with citing two important items in Dunnigan's uh, Complete War Games Handbook. A complete version of the handbook is available at that URL at the bottom of the slide. And he had two basic rules for game design. Number one, keep it simple. And number two, plagiarize. He also said use available techniques when he wanted to be a little bit more euphemistic, but let's be blunt and say plagiarize. Keep these two rules in mind throughout the rest of this presentation and all the other things I'm gonna be talking about. You need to keep it simple, especially at the start and plagiarize. If you find something that you like, if you find something that particularly resonates with you or that you find uh, especially understandable or relatable, then use it, use available techniques. Now, Dunnigan also identified 10 steps in the design and development of a game. And if you're thinking of making a game that anyone besides yourself might want to use, you'll have to consider them. The first three steps, the concept development, the research, and the integration of your research and concept are critical to how your game will perform as a design. Don't skimp on the time spent and thought spent on these first three steps. That's what makes your game as a design. But the remaining seven steps are important to how you bring your game into fruition as a completed and distributed product. And at every stage, there's a question that you have to consider, quote points that you have to consider uh, in order to make your game work as a game. So uh, in step four, for example, when you create your first prototype, this is where you first set down the overall look and the components of your design. When you write the first draft of your rules, step five, <clears throat> you save yourself time by formatting and organizing your rules to a consistent style. Number six, game development. That's when you start uh, playing through the game and introducing it to other people. That's where you refine the ergonomics of text and images. So in your own place through the game, you can see what does and doesn't work in the relation between text, images, and graphics. Blind testing. When you start blind testing, play testers will tell you what got in the way of enjoying the game. Editing, when, when you finally polish the design, is a refinement of how those text and graphics work together. Production is your last chance to make it work. Well, okay, feedback is your last chance to make it work because you can always, when you're self-publishing, you can always go back and do something a little bit better. Now, the question might arise, why do this at all? Self-publishing is how I got started and you can do this too. Um, what the heck? Sorry about that, bloody Adobe. So itchy brain, the condition called itchy brain. Everybody has a creative urge somewhere within them. And the better adjusted people among us manage to smother enough of that so that we continue to function as part of public society and even polite society. So everybody has some kind of creative urge, creative impulse. Uh, often you run it off into, uh, well, okay, I can do better than that. Maybe it doesn't sound very nice, but it's no secret that every game designer started out as a game player. And they knew they wanted to, at the very least, start by adding to or modifying what they were playing to suit their particular understanding or enjoyment of the topic. Me, I started design, to design back in 1990 because no one or hardly anyone was publishing games on the kinds of topics that I wanted to play. So my first complete, four completed game designs were on urban riots, the coup d'etat, political violence in the United States during the Great Depression, and the UN intervention in Somalia. This was all in the early 90s and hardly anybody had done any kind of uh, game along those particular topics. Um, so I made more of what I wanted to see in the world. And finally, presentation of your research or desire to inform others. Everybody has a particular interest. I think a lot of us here have a particularly strong interest in history, both uh, contemporary history and, and older periods of history. Uh, we all enjoy doing research uh, and finding things out, and we have a desire to impart our work, our research, our information to other people. And this last point is a particular interest of mine, because aside from the obvious historical and educational connotations, games give us a way to make sense of the contemporary world, and to me, self-publishing games is a great method to communicate this sense to others. 
Now in, 20, in 2011, Ian Bogost, um, uh, I think you might be familiar with him uh, from some of your readings, wrote a book called News Games. The book was about how video games distributed to the internet could improve the effectiveness of journalists in achieving their objectives. And the objectives of journalism are to inform, educate, criticize, and persuade, and possibly rescue their reputation and livelihood at the same time. Now, Bogost is an academic writer in the field of game studies. And this field, as an academic field, is almost completely devoted to computer and video games and is astoundingly ignorant of its tactile analog past. It infuriates me no end. The fact is, though, the practice of producing manual news games on contemporary issues predates video games by a very long time, and it maintains a tradition of citizen-based social criticism and analytic journalism in graphic form. James Dunnigan, there he is again, added tremendously to this practice when he started to publish Strategy and Tactics magazine in 1969-1970. Each issue of Strategy and Tactics contained a playable game. These games were something that were very different for their time. They were sophisticated, thoroughly researched and modeled simulations designed by people who were generally not professional analysts or historians. And besides the game, the magazine would also contain up to five or 10,000 words or more of analysis, uh, all about the history, the course and the broader aspects of the conflict portrayed in the game. Normally this lead article was also written by the game's designer. So the writer got to present his research twice once as a standard written feature in a magazine, and again, where the research was quantified and joined with a set of game mechanics and graphics to make a game that readers could play and explore the topic for themselves. Now, Dunnigan published games on current and hypothetical conflicts pretty much from the start of strategy and tactics. Um, but an especially interesting example here is the game Arabian Nightmare Kuwait War. That appeared in issue number 139. This game on the first Gulf War was probably the first manual war game to be primarily designed, tested, and devel developed over the internet. Within days of the Iraqi invasion in August 1990, uh, James Dunnigan and Austin Bay, his co-designer, began to communicate over the Genie online service, which is something very few people remember now, uh, would communicate there with developers, playtesters, and graphic artists to create a game that reached subscribers in January 1991, only five months after the invasion, and just, uh, just in time for the real Operation Desert Storm. Now, here are some other examples. Uh, the middle example, A Raid of Missiles, is a postcard game by Paul Rohrbaugh that was designed in 2012 on the conflict in Gaza of that year, and that came out within a few uh, weeks of that particular conflict and was profiled in uh, a piece in Foreign Policy magazine written by Michael Peck. And on the right is a sample of artwork from my own game, Ukrainian Crisis, uh, which um, I, I designed in 2014 over the weekend uh, that the people of the Crimea had a, uh, a referendum on uh, rejoining uh, with Russia or not. And I don't know if anybody recognizes that woman in the card, the woman in the yellow dress, uh, she is Jen Psaki, who I understand is now Joe Biden's um, head of his communications team. So that's one thing that you can do by self-publishing your games. It's an act of citizen journalism, and it's a particular interest of mine. And uh, I think uh, I also need to take a moment here to talk about your, uh, just some aspects of intellectual property and your rights and responsibilities. Um, I'm really the last person to give anyone any kind of legal advice, even legal sounding advice, and different countries have very different regimes of law. So the linked article uh, under the AmericanBar.org uh, URL there is for Americans. Uh, I know we have some people here uh, from outside of the United States, including myself. So the particular um, rights and restrictions of, of law in your country may differ. But basically, most of the, of the understandings uh, all subscribe to the principle that you, as the creator, have the moral and legal right to assert yourself as the creator of an original work, and you can set the conditions under which your work can be used. Um, the basic thing to remember, though, is that game mechanics themselves are not copyrightable. Nobody has a patent on the hexagon, um, except maybe honeybees. You don't want to antagonize the bees. Um, but the things that you create using game mechanics are definitely copyright, copyrightable and they are your intellectual property. And personally, I keep things simple and I make much of my material on my website, game variants uh, and such, available through a Creative Commons license. 
There are different flavors of these, but uh, I chose a particular type that uh, is called attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. This basically means that someone using my work must give appropriate credit to me. They may not use the material for commercial purposes or gain, and they may not make it appear that uh, whatever they do with it, that I endorse or support what they have done with it. And if they remix or transform or build upon the material, they may not distribute the modified material as if it were my work. Now, a few things in life are really original. I say, as designers, we crouch on the shoulders of giants. If you owe a creative debt to someone, if their work has been an inspiration to you, or if they furnish the basic mechanics of your game, you have a responsibility to say so. It's a courtesy at the very least, and nobody will think less of you for doing so. It's good to name check. Now, we're going to talk about self-publishing methods. There are D, uh, desktop publishing or DTP means uh, in, in this presentation just means in a general way that you have somehow used your desktop computer to create a set of components in the nature of a game. And we're going to talk about methods of publishing and distributing uh, through three different methods. But with each and every one of these three different methods, you have to have a satisfactory desktop published product first whether it's going to be a print and play item, that is, uh, it's a PDF or some other uh, document that's distributed over the internet for people to print themselves, or if it's a print on demand article where you uh, create it and then uh, print it yourself or have somebody print it, the physical item for you, or you might go the digital self-publishing route. In any case uh, of the three, you have to have a quality DTP product. So with desktop publishing, the pro of desktop publishing, of course, is the desktop publishing software, and it sits in home in everyone's home computer. And DTP and the internet, I think, saved board wargaming from complete oblivion. Uh, board wargaming had it's reached its zenith in the early 80s, and uh, its numbers were much reduced uh, in the early 80s with the advent of home computers, and people started to play uh, computer games. And board wargaming um, had a big correction, but of course, in the last 20 or years or more, we've seen a great renaissance of interest in board gaming, uh, any kind of board game, uh, and board wargaming has, has come back as well, in that the internet allowed people to start, who had never given up on a hobby, to communicate with each other and to bring new people into the hobby. And of course, DTP, doing it for yourself on your home computer, offers a great outlet for creativity. There are very few cons to this. Um, the only thing I can say about it is not everybody is James Dunnigan, but you know, not everyone needs to be. Uh, let a hundred flowers bloom, you know, let a hundred schools of thought contend. And we have really seen that because the number of games that are uh, published in, in some form uh, and distributed across the internet uh, or through the market each year is, uh, is just as large as it ever was in the eighties. So um, although, the, num the hobby might be smaller in terms of numbers. It's just as creative as it ever was and before. So over the next couple of few slides, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of your choices uh, for selecting software for creating a desktop published product. Um, give you some thoughts I have on text and graphics in uh, working through your game design and presenting it. Uh, some examples of how to make your own game components in a very old school way. I will say that one thing I've learned um, in putting material together for this presentation is that there is an awful lot that I have to learn. <laughs> um, so the methods I'm going to be talking about are maybe a little bit old school, but they're low tech and they always work. And then finally, I'll give you some references and resources uh, to look up uh, to give you some advice or places where you can find software and things like that. So DTP software, when you're putting together a game, every game has text elements in it. Every game has graphic elements in it and they go together and you have to produce it uh, in some form. So for text elements, the basic need is for some kind of word processor or if you're going the digital self-publishing route, uh, some kind of hypertext generator if uh, you're going to work through some kind of interactive fiction or text-based text game. Um, graphic elements, of course, need a graphics program of some kind uh, and there's some examples there. 
And then finally, production. Um, generally, uh, the, the software that you're using will allow you to save in PDF format, uh, which is perfectly acceptable, I think, for just about any, any purpose. Sometimes, though, you need a printing assistant. So there are PDF makers out there that are available that will allow you to resize um, uh, and uh, size your, your material properly uh, for people who want to print it. Poster Razor is one I've discovered recently uh, that is particularly good for sizing PDF maps and counter sheets and things like that. <clears throat> now, here's a table of uh, different software choices you have uh, for things that can put together text, cards, counters, maps, anything. Um, these are just some popular programs that I know that people have used to make their own self-published games. Um, notice the prevalence of free items. I am a cheap guy. I have never paid for software in my life. I have always used whatever came bundled with my computer uh, or a no cost and often easier to use uh, freeware alternative. Also note the examples of suites or bundles of uh, programs that are intended to work together like Google Docs. Uh, my personal favorite of course is LibreOffice which is a variant of OpenOffice. Its elements work together very well uh, for uh, drawing things, uh, processing text, uh, you know, anything you might need. Um, and they work very well together and they export quite nicely from and to Microsoft Office formats. And of course, if you happen to have Microsoft Office uh, in your computer, you have uh, a whole uh, variety of uh, programs uh, that are intended to work together. Um, there are some other items here uh, that have particular uses. Um, things like Campaign Cartographer is specialized for producing maps. So is something called Hexdraw. Uh, GIMP is uh, a, a raster editor uh, that people use to put together uh, sometimes really beautiful looking counters and maps. Bit of a learning curve to put it together, um, but it is a, a favorite with some people. Uh, Inkscape is another one with a bit of a learning curve, but it's very flexible. Um, and personally, I found these a little difficult to use, but there are some real GIMP artists out there. And there is a BGG a Board Game Geek user by the name of Pella Nielsen, who has developed of his own path some extensions for Inkscape that are really powerful for automating and streamlining a lot of the artistic tasks in making a game. So assembling counter sheets, uh, making up cards, uh, generating maps, these sorts of things. Um, oh, one, more, one other form. Uh, some of these uh, are identified as raster editors. So GIMP and paint.net are both raster editors. Um, if you don't know the difference between the two, uh, raster uh, or bitmap graphics give you great detail, but vector uh, editors uh, are graphics programs that give you great scalability. Uh, to me, the programs that are easier to use are the vector ones. Um, but again, you can go with your particular preference uh, and what you've learned to use. And of course, there's always software uh, that's available to convert graphics of one kind to the other. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about text. The first thing to remember about game rules is that they're examples of technical writing. They are a set of instructions. They're not a friendly chat between you and the player with discursions and in-jokes. Sometimes you can try to have it both ways. Um, the publishers of Root, uh, I think that may be a game that's popular uh, uh, with a few people here. It was published a couple of years ago. Uh, very interesting and well-constructed asymmetric game. The publishers of Root included two rule books with the game. One was called Learning to Play, which was written in a very conversational style. And it was intended to be used, I think, by maybe one person uh, using the book to explain orally to other people how to play the game in a group. Now, although this game was, uh, this rule book was written very casually in tone, it was white, very, very carefully written, I thought. Not everybody can pull this off. The second rule book was called The Law of Root, which is a more conventionally and carefully worded rules document for people to parse and argue about. Once they had understood the game and learned how to play, now they learn how to argue about it. And what does that really mean? Now, whatever language style is used, the information in a set of rules needs to be accessible for reference again and again. So again, a technical document. So rules need to be consistently laid out and organized for efficient retrieval of that information. So once again, let's stick to Dunnigan's two basic rules. Keep it simple and plagiarize. 
So keep it simple. You index your rules according to main sections and subsections using a decimal numbering system that shows the hierarchy and the relationships of, of these rules that organizes the thoughts, both your thoughts when you're sitting down and writing out the, the bones of the game. It also uh, sets out the basic principles of the game for your, uh, for your players. The main section should be ordered also that they follow the sequence of play so that the player will mentally encounter them as they go through a um, uh, as they go through the through the game turn. Uh, for points about layout, uh, two columns of text. Try not to go any smaller than ten point type, and uh, don't overdo the use of bullet lists uh, or text formatting like uh, bold and italic text. So that's keeping it simple. Second simple rule, of course, plagiarize. Find a set of rules that you found easy to understand and imitate it. Imitate how it was put together, imitate how it was written. Um, and it's likely that if you found it easy to understand, other people will also find it easy to understand. And then alongside the rules are the player aids, charts, tables, diagrams, illustrations. And this brings us to graphics because the layout of these items is even more important than the legibility of the rules. That man is Redmond A. Simonson. Redmond Simonson was the first graphic designer to seriously apply his craft to war game design. He supervised the graphics and the production of several hundred games during his time at James Dunnigan's company, SPI, and he designed a dozen or two complete games himself. Simonson said that simulation games were enormous information processing and learning problems. You know, think about it. The players manipulating dozens of pieces on a map which has hundreds of locations, sorting out thousands of possible relationships, all the while making up several different plans of action that get modified and mutated during a game. So the graphic designer's task is to make the information the player must use in the course of play very clear, organized, accessible, and of course, pleasing to look at for long periods of time. Simonson uh, used the metaphor of the player as, think of, think of the player as an untrained demolitions man and he's faced with a, a bomb, a complex bomb that he has to defuse. Now, he's getting pre-recorded instructions on a radio coming over a set of headphones uh, for him to use while he's trying to defuse this complex bomb. The game is the bomb. The game designer made the tape of instructions that's being played over the radio, and the artwork is the radio. If the artwork in the game is faulty and confusing, and therefore the signal breaks up during transmission, the player cannot concentrate on the task. And while there may not be a boom, the experience will be a bust. So in a few slides, I'll supply a link to a section of a book that SPI published in 1977 on war game design called, originally enough, War Game Design. Um, and this section of the book has Simonson writing at length on the physical systems design of games. And I really strongly recommend this to your attention uh, when you come to the point of putting a game uh, down on paper and presenting it to other people. <clears throat> Simonson stopped doing war game graphics in the early 80s, so he never had access to a, a desktop computer for any of the work that he had uh, to do for SPI. And the kind of software that we now take for granted, um, that's uh, for free, uh, just simply did not exist when he worked at this company. He had rubber cement, Letraset, a light table, and some markers to work with. We have so much more choice and flexibility today, but we need to remember the principles of clean, informative design. And if you read that section uh, that Simonson wrote, there will be a lot of pointers and a lot of uh, indications of uh, directions that you should follow. So again, just because there are hundreds and hundreds of different things your graphics soft, uh, software may be able to do for you, doesn't always mean that you have to do it. You don't have to exploit every part of the software. So once again, keep it simple and plagiarize. And what would Raymond, Redmond A. Simonson do? So the next couple of slides are samples of Simonson work. These are Simonson counters. Um, this is just black and white, but he tended to go for uh, pretty, simple, uh, uh, pretty simple schemes of color, uh, just because of the printing technology that was available during the day, uh, in, in the day. Um, you can see that these, game, um, these counters were almost always half an inch square, so blown up. Uh, I've blown them up on this slide here so you can see a little bit more of the detail. And you can see that they are loaded with a certain amount of information, quite a few, um, quite a few numbers, uh, quite a bit of information, 
uh, but at the same time, they're clean and they're easy to distinguish. And uh, also see the level of complexity on each uh, type of, of uh, counter, whether it represents a land unit, a naval unit, or an air unit. So the ones in the top row are tactical games. So we see a, a counter representing one soldier, one ship, and one aircraft. Uh, and then the, uh, in succeeding rows, these counters move up in scale and the bottom row are grand strategic. So uh, uh, at the bottom there, that's like a French army, uh, a surface fleet and a fleet of long range bombers. So you can see in the middle range where we have tactical and operational games, um, there tends to be more information on, on, the, um, on the counter itself, but at the opposite ends of the scale, the very, very tactical and the grand strategic, there isn't as much of a requirement for information on the, uh, on the board itself. Here's an example of two examples of uh, maps that Redmond Simonson used. Again, the printing technology of the day, uh, they were limited to just a few shades of color that they could apply to a map. And you can see in the left-hand map, which is a map of a section of Middle Earth, um, how they managed to use overlays of color and some uh, interesting little art uh, pieces of art to uh, suggest uh, a, you know, an, an old style map, but still it's something that works very well uh, for uh, playing a, a game. Now, um, that's a, a somewhat naturalist appearance uh, to a map. Um, Simonson also liked to experiment. So the right-hand map is an example of a game on, on Tito and as part of an army. And this uh, game wasn't all that well received by people back when it was just, uh, came out in 1980 um, because it was a little bit too experimental. But me, I kind of like it for its schematic look and for its use of colors. Uh, it still manages to convey a lot of information in a fairly small area uh, in a very clean way. Um, but I, I, I was, and I think am in the minority there still. But these are examples, uh, you know, two polar examples of the kind of work that you could do um, with his maps. And if something from 1978 doesn't flip your lid, here's an example of a really good player aid card from Root, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, it has really nice use of color, nice green color scheme, um, just and it picks up on the green color of the pieces. Um, the, uh, the graphics are, are nicely used, a little bit of decoration, um, and uh, the, uh, the boxes and illustration uh, are, and so forth are, are nicely laid out. And the text is informative, but it's not obtrusive. So I think these, this is a good example of a more modern look uh, of, uh, of graphic design for player aids. I'd like you to remember when you're putting together your maps and your counters, uh, to remember colorblind people. Almost 9% of the population in the world are, uh, are colorblind, the color weak or colorblind. There are three kinds, three main kinds of colorblindness, uh, 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 protan, dutan, or tritan. Uh, dutan or red-green confusion or green-red confusion, those are the most two most common types. And uh, tritan, um, tri tritanopy, tritanopy? Anyway, um, I know what this word means, I just don't know how to say it, uh, is quite rare. So this particular palette that I found here, uh, I also recommend this to your attention. It doesn't look, the, the colors under the protan and dutan columns don't look exactly the way they do um, to someone who is not colorblind, but they remain distinct enough from each other so that someone who is not colorblind, but someone who is colorblind can still distinguish uh, between the different colors and the different shades that are used. So an example um, of this is, uh, is this one. Uh, this is a recent game that came out from Decision Games called Block by Block. The left-hand frame is what the colors look like to someone who is not colorblind. And the one on the right is how, this is how it would look to someone who is, uh, who, who, someone who has red-green colorblindness. So can you imagine playing a game where practically all the counters are shades of brown? That's what it looks like. And I know that they have put other indications, you know, text and icons and such. Uh, but the first thing that your eye will pick up is the color. And when everything is more or less the same color, uh, 
anyway, this is, a, this is a little bit of a confusion, I think, that you can avoid. Um, in a couple of slides, I'll give you a link to some online colorblind simulators so that you can see, once you put your map or counter sheet together, how it will appear to a colorblind person. Now, I'm going to talk for a little bit about how to make counters or cards. The basic idea with counters or cards is to work it in layers. So there will be a layer of text, there'll be a layer of fonts uh, or images, and then there'll be a layer of colors. Again, keep it simple. Don't get cute. Resist the impulse to load the counter with too much or even worse, redundant information. Uh, we looked a, a, a moment ago at Simonson's counters. They had a lot of numbers on them, but they were all numbers that were needed during play constantly, uh, and they were bold and they were easy to read. I have seen counters uh, in games that are currently in print that used a watermark on the counter and a national flag and a color scheme all at the same time to convey the same single piece of information, what country the unit was from. And we've all seen examples of tactical games that might use a letter code and a realistic picture of a weapon and a map marking symbol to tell you oh, three ways to tell you, yes, this is all the same thing. It's an anti-tank gun. And also remember when you're putting your counters together that something that looks really spiffy when it's blown up to like six inches square on a computer screen could be a blurry little blob when it's reduced to a little half inch chip of cardboard, especially when you get to be my age and my grade of Coke bottle glasses. Don't do this. Don't make Redmond Simonson's ghost angry at you. Here's how I make my counters. This is a, a sample of counters for a game design I'm working on uh, right now called Brief Border Wars, Volume 2. And um, how I put these counters together, uh, I gener the, the concept was to put them in three layers. So the bottom layer is the counter frame grid. Uh, so that's the little uh, grid that the uh, images for the counter sits in. Uh, this was simply a spreadsheet. Uh, that I had uh, used in LibreOffice. So I started a spreadsheet, set it up. Uh, cells are half an inch square. Uh, borders were set to be a 0.05 of a point. Then you lay this down onto the, uh, the base layer to be the base layer of your document, uh, which is a drawing document, and you lock it um, so that it doesn't move around while you're clicking and adjusting other things uh, on the counter sheet. Next is layer two, which is the unit icons. So the, what you will do to assemble the unit icons is essentially they're grouped text boxes. Uh, so in the case here, uh, you know, with this, uh, uh, with this particular uh, counter, which is a, a group of aircraft, Italian aircraft, uh, CR-42 model. So CR-42 is, is a text box. Uh, the F and the two are also a text box and they're arranged perpendicular to each other and grouped. And then we have this, uh, in this case, the, uh, the formation symbol is a, something I used from a Dingbat font, um, which is, uh, in this case, uh, a font called A.H. Blitzkrieg by Tom Mouet. And uh, it, again, this is a, uh, a, uh, a, um, a Dingbat font. Uh, so it makes for very small uh, si file sizes for your counter sheets uh, overall. Um, also, you can use small graphics, um, but again, you can group these things, group and ungroup them, arrange them and scale them. Uh, that's the, the beauty of uh, one of these simpler um, um, suite type programs. The font that I used uh, for these is Universe or Helvetica, a nice bold sans serif uh, kind of font uh, that is still readable at a fair distance. So that's layer two, which is the icons themselves. Um, and then finally, layer three, which is the color in this case uh, that shows um, the, the particular colors that, uh, you know, in this case, the top half of the Italian units and then the bottom half are the Greek units. This is a 1940 Italo-Greek war game. Um, so basically you just get a rectangle uh, you, uh, that's filled with a particular color, give it a 50% transparency with no border, uh, slap it down over the counters that have that particular color to show ownership and send it to the back. Um, of the uh, of the arrangements so that the the uh, the icons uh, and, and the text comes out to the fore and makes it readable. Um, and of course, 
I, I started, of course, with a, a counterframe grid, which was a spreadsheet with uh, cells that were all half an inch square. The beauty, if you're going the print and play route, is that you can make the counters any size and any shape you want because you don't have to respect a die cutter, not like the, the way uh, it used to be in, the, in the, the, the days of SPI. A lot of print and demand outfits, that's a method we'll be talking about later, also use laser, laser cutters instead of die cutters now anyway. So you can use, um, you can get uh, counters of just about any shape and any size. But for making a simple layout, just with simple square counters, uh, this is something that you can do and that's pretty easy. Cards. Again, we apply the same logic with cards. This is a card uh, that was um, produced uh, for Colonial Twilight, a game I did with GMT on uh, the French-Algerian War. And uh, it's a professionally produced product, but when I was making my playtest copies, um, uh, this is the same uh, approach that I took. So uh, the bottom layer is the card frame grid. In this case, it's two and a half by three and a half inches, the dimensions of an ordinary playing card. Um, borders, so it gives you uh, lines to cut. And if you want a transparent background image, uh, in this case, the artist has used uh, like the suggestion of a, a map of Algeria. And again, your base layer is locked because you'll be laying your images and text boxes on top of it. You don't want things to shift around on you while you're doing that. Layer two will be the image. Uh, two common images uh, are JPEGs or PNGs. Uh, they make for fairly short uh, or fairly small uh, files if you turn the resolution down on them um, and they can become quite, quite easy. Um, I like this particular card. It's called factionalism because the guy on the right is given the suspicious eye to that dopey looking guy on the left. I always like that image. Then finally, layer three um, is the text boxes or the textual information that's contained uh, in the card. Um, again, these are just uh, text boxes that you position uh, on top of the grid. Uh, if you're going to have shaded text, uh, you know, in this case, uh, in this particular game, uh, you need to set it off from the other text box because it has a different purpose. Uh, so again, we fill the rectangle, um, give it no border and a 50% transparency and send it to the back so that the black text uh, can uh, show through. And again, making a map, you have the same concept. So first of all, you have the base layer of a map, uh, which will be the divisions of the map. There are many different schools of what kind of a map works best for your particular purpose. Uh, so you can have a map that's drawn with irregular areas. Uh, the hex map is familiar to all of us. And there are also uh, other schemes like point to point. So the map divisions will be your base layer. On top of that, you will put terrain, uh, terrain features. So natural terrain like forest, and mountains and things, and man-made terrain like cities, towns, railroads, that kind of thing. And then finally, you'll put your additional graphic elements on the top. Um, so here's an example of a game that I did on the uh, allied invasions of Yugoslavia in, during World War II that never happened. So layer one, uh, up here is a hex grid. So what I did was I found a PDF of a hex grid of the proper size. I inserted it as the base layer and locked it. Layer two, I drew in the coastlines. Uh, the water is a filled polygon that has straight edges, uh, but also butts up against the coastlines here. And it's just given um, a, a, light, a pleasing light blue color. Layer three is natural terrain. So you see that I've got, a, I've used a combination of icons from a dingbat font, uh, plus some filled shapes of different shades uh, so that hills over here are differentiated from mountains. Um, so again, this is a free form polygon uh, or curve and you've, uh, and it's just filled with a particular uh, color and given a transparency so that the icons uh, can show through nicely. That's natural terrain. Layer four is artificial terrain. So uh, ports, symbols, uh, railroads, that kind of thing. And then finally embellishment. So there was uh, this particular game used a, uh, a, um, a, a, like a, a combat table or a battle table where you would set out different units uh, facing each other. Uh, they would roll dice against each other and their um, artillery and attack and naval units would be arranged behind them. So 
uh, this is where, you know, this is a, a space that used constantly during the game to resolve battles. So it deserves a place on the map itself. And then of course you have your fancy stuff like your title. Production. Once you've taken all these lessons to heart and you've assembled your counters, cards if you're using them and maps, generally PDF or portable document format is the most usable form. Uh, it exports readily. It makes uh, uh, files that are not too big, uh, pretty easy for people to print themselves um, or for small press outfits to work with. Um, this, there are always things you can do to manage your file size and make it fairly small. Um, you can scale and compress your images. If you use dingbat fonts uh, for uh, silhouettes, uh, on your counters or for uh, needle map marking symbols, those kinds of things, instead of drawing them yourselves, um, you can save a lot of file size on that. Maybe that's not so much of a problem now with the internet, uh, but you know, when I get a file from someone, you know, and it's like 62 megabytes uh, and it's a small map, that's going to be very, very difficult for me to print if I can do it at all on my, on my home printer. So I promised you references and resources. There they are. Um, Tom Muat's Map Sims fonts are fantastic. Tom is a major in the British Army, and he created these sets of fonts for UK land forces. He has many other fonts that he's made for other purposes as well. Uh, his uh, Go to the website. His stuff there is free. Uh, but please tip him a few pounds uh, to show him that you appreciate his work. And if you use his work, um, in your in putting your game together, give him a design credit for, you know, for graphics or just a note that you use those map sim spots. Again, it was his work. Uh, it's useful to you and everybody else. Uh, you should give a credit. Um, free fonts download. There are hundreds and hundreds of uh, font sites on the map uh, all over the internet. This one is one I found that has uh, some interesting examples of dingbat fonts or other things like that. Again, when you're using text fonts uh, for your counters, uh, Universe or Helvetica, something not very fancy but still bold is uh, a really good way to go. Uh, I've seen people use a lot of um, experiments with fonts uh, and different styles of fonts and it generally is not as satisfactory. Uh, graphics and physical systems design. This is the section I was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, you can get a copy of this, uh, uh, of this section of the book uh, at the URL. Um, some of what Simonson writes in the chapter relates only to pretty dead tech. Hardly anybody now uses Letraset or dye washes to color counter sheets. But what he says about how to present text and graphics and how to make them work together is gold. So please um, have a read of that. Um, there are grids, square grids, hex grids, uh, triangle grids, all kinds of things that you can use uh, at that URL. Um, our friends in the role-playing game world uh, have all kinds of online map makers that you can put together and uh, you can put together a simple map and save it for yourself. And I mentioned colorblind simulators as well. Uh, and tutorials and guidance. Uh, there's a lot of really good advice lurking on Board Game Geek, where a lot of designers get together and talk about what does and doesn't work uh, for them. Um, Armchair Dragoons uh, Forum, which is the forum of choice for the uh, Georgetown University Society. Uh, they've got a forum on designing and creating, so go and have a look there. Uh, and of course, there's other guidance in other places, Board Game Geek and even Facebook, on how to put uh, your material together. Again, uh, remember those two basic rules, keep it simple and plagiarize. If you, if you find yourself playing and enjoying something you like, try to do something along those lines while keeping it as simple as possible. Now, we're gonna talk about uh, production and distribution methods. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is print and play. Basically what you do is you use all that software we've been talking about in these methods to create a set of digital desktop published files. Um, you make that file available to someone somehow uh, through your own website or through a, uh, a pay website like Wargame Vault or Wargame Downloads. Uh, and people download the, the file and they print it out themselves. Uh, the pro of course is uh, a low cost to everybody. Um, and uh, of course, version control, because you have control uh, over time 
of replacing and updating the particular files. Um, so that if uh, you find some kind of combination that works better, or if somebody gives you feedback, makes you a suggestion of how something might work together a little bit better, you could make that change and you can, um, and you can maintain that kind of control, which is something you lose um, when you give uh, a game to a publisher uh, who may end up doing all kinds of things to it graphically. Um, of course, there are some drawbacks here. Uh, it really depends on your crafting skill. A uh, few people, I think, really enjoy crafting and putting things together. They'd much rather get playing. Um, and so inevitably, a lot of people might be a little bit disappointed uh, with what they've managed to make, as opposed to a finished product, <clears throat> something that was produced professionally and assembled in a factory in China. Um, again, distribution models. Uh, if you're going to distribute something for free, um, you can uh, put them on a personal or institutional website. On my own website, um, I make a, a number of free games, six or seven games available on my website for free. Uh, uh, and they're all uh, as sets of PDF files. Um, I have a lot of company here. Uh, you can go to Board Game Geek and you can search out geek lists of print and play games on all kinds of topics. Um, I talked about copy lefting. Um, sometimes this is uh, this may happen. Someone may take uh, your files and distribute them, um, you know, uh, on their own. Uh, in the particular case of copy lefting that I mentioned is uh, a game I did on the Battle of Seattle, which was the anti-WTO uh, riots in Seattle in 2000. And I discovered um, I designed that game in 2000, and since then I've discovered several radical. Uh, websites had uh, taken uh, copies of this, of course, without presenting their work as my work or my work as their work. Uh, but uh, without my knowledge, they would do that. But, you know, I, I, I was okay with it because I had, again, I had taken the trouble to make it clear to people that the material, the free games the, that are there for free down download are available on this particular kind of, of uh, common, uh, Creative Commons license. Um, if you want to make a little bit of coin at it, and you will make only a tiny little bit of coin at it, um, there you can partner with uh, an outfit like Wargame Vault or Wargame Downloads. Um, I recently partnered with Wargame Vault to make PDF copies of half a dozen of my four pay games design uh, games available. Um, I had been making uh, about half a dozen games of mine available through DTP. Uh, I would go to the copy shop and I would do print on demand. I'd print up small batches of uh, counter sheets, maps and things, and I would assemble them and I would mail them to people when they um, sent me the money to do it. Um, but I've been working from home since March and I can't get near any copy shops. And it's not really worth trying for me to print all this at home. So I ended up running out of most components for most of my titles. A lot of them I couldn't print at home anyway because of the size of the maps and so forth. So I cre simply created PDF files of these and uploaded them war to Wargame Vault. Saves me time and trouble. I still get 70% of the price that I set on the website because Wargame Vault takes a 30% cut. And that's the value to me. And of course, the real value, though, from the customer's point of view, is that they can order Brian Train products when they're drunk at 3 a.m., which is, I think, when most online purchases are, purchases are made anyway, and they can get them right away and then try and put that together, try printing and playing when you've had a few points. Another method is print on demand. So call this one the artisanal war game. So you print small batches of the game yourself uh, and hope for the best, like I was doing until I ran out of components, or you can get someone else to print it for you and maybe they'll distribute it for you too. Um, this was one of my first engagements with publishers back in the 90s uh, with a group called the Microgame Co-op, which we later had to call the Microgame Design Group in 1994-95. The design group turned out over 40 games in eight years. That was not a bad output, and quite a few of the games were picked up by large publishers later. But at the time, what we had was a simple DTP product, and uh, we made it available. Uh, stuff was printed on a laser printer, uh, photocopied rules, and we sent it to people uh, for pretty much the price that it cost to create the thing, to print it out and to mail it to them. Um, so we were a little bit different in that we were a war game publishing company that was nonprofit by intent and not by outcome. So that made us a little bit different. So the pros of print on demand, again, are inventory control. 
Um, the whole deal with printing is that the more you can print of something, the cheaper it gets. However, you don't necessarily want to be stuck with 12,000 copies of a particular game that maybe not very many people want. And that's happened to a number of people who thought they were saving money by getting a, a whack of copies printed at once. Uh, but then it just became a, 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 a storage <laughs> a storage problem. Um, of course, if you're printing things for yourself, um, there's you have you end up making many trips to the coffee shop, the office supply store for your raw materials and your post office. You can get someone else to print it for you and maybe distribute it for you, but they have to get paid. And sometimes it can get be it can get really expensive for everyone involved. And this is maybe perhaps the least efficient uh, and most costly in terms of producing physical product and getting it to people. However, the beauty of it is inventory control is, um, and of course, again, being able to keep version control too, because if you don't print too many copies at a time, you can correct course as you go along. Now, print on demand people, uh, a local coffee shop will work for you. Um, maybe if you have an understanding faculty member or an oblivious employer, uh, you can do some production that way. Uh, two outfits I, I know of are Blue Panther. Uh, this is a one-man outfit. Uh, he produces titles for several companies that I've published with, uh, including Holland Spiel. Uh, he also uses laser cut counters. So I mentioned laser cut counters a little while ago. So you could um, have uh, on your counter sheet counters of just about any kind of uh, size or shape you like. Game Crafter is a business that will make multiple copies of a game. You give them the files and they will print them out and they will assemble something and they will uh, give it a, uh, and they will uh, mail it to people um, who buy it. They will go all the way down to making individual copies of a game and they have an amazing array of wooden and plastic game bits available uh, that you can buy separately or you can just say put you know so many of this little blue meeple in the box uh, but it's expensive. Uh, for them to print it, assemble it, pack it, and ship it for you. Uh, but it's a, it can be a, a really uh, hassle-free way. Once you get all the files the way you want them to be, it's a good hassle-free way to, um, to get the product out there. Uh, and you can get a pretty good, uh, they print a pretty good quality product. And again, they have access to large stocks of uh, little bits and pieces that you may want to use in your games. Another method is digital self-publishing. <clears throat> this is a digital port of your game that's playable on a computer or a browser. So the counters are cards, the pieces in the game become manipulable objects on top of your map, which is also a, a digital surface or other playing surface. So the pro means that the item doesn't physically exist. So um, besides your, you know, trying to make things come together, the text and the images come together, once you've managed to do that, you don't have to worry about printing color, that kind of, um, um, or, or actual means of physical production. Version control is also very good because you can, um, you can literally put these, these uh, things together and make changes on the fly. And there are some uh, digital uh, game playing programs that will handle, you know, mundane record keeping functions for you. Um, cons, uh, all of the methods that I've uh, described so far have been fairly low tech. Uh, if you are okay with learning yet more software and creating yet another version of your game for people to play, if you've got the time and the inclination to do that, maybe that's not really so much of a con, uh, but it can be a bit of a time sink. Um, distribution method, of course, is primarily over the internet. I also wanted to mention uh, just for a moment about interactive fiction and text-based games. This, doesn't, this is something that doesn't always immediately spring to people's minds as a game for some people. But I'm, I'll guarantee almost all of you have leafed your way through some kind of a short or a long choose your own adventure article or a book where you hop between paragraphs and pages as you make decisions about what you or your character does. So with interactive fiction or a text-based game, the idea is the same, only it's done on a computer. This really took off with role-playing games crowd uh, not too long ago. And I've also seen some excellent examples of this method used for education and training aids. Uh, I mentioned Major Tom Mouet a, a little while ago. Uh, Tom put together uh, a long ago a basic battle skills game for British Army soldiers uh, using the format of a Windows help file. So in that particular item, you would uh, each card would give you a little bit of a decision, a little vignette, a little decision that you had to make, and you would click your decision and it would say, okay, well, you know, you shouldn't have picked up 
that thing that looked like a black baseball. If there was a grenade and it blew up. Um, so creating a text-based game, it can be a lot of writing um, and to fill in and embellish the story that the player is building in their head or should be building in their head as they play your game. But it can be very rewarding. And of course, if you're the kind of person who really enjoys to do a lot of writing, if you're a storyteller at heart uh, and you'd rather tell a story than write a set of instructions for a game, um, this can be uh, an interesting um, out outlet for you. So here are some um, choices you have in picking out software for doing digital board games. Some of these uh, are free uh, and some of them are dependent on a particular web, uh, are, are web-based, so they're agnostic about platforms. Some of them work with specific um, uh, operating systems. Uh, there is a difference between asynchronous and synchronous play. Um, even with an asynchronous game, uh, you can still play hot seat. Uh, so you can just uh, uh, play the game as, uh, and, and just swap between players. Um, so far, I have seen very few examples of manual games that were produced as effectively a straight to vassal format, but there are such. Um, meanwhile, uh, things like vassal uh, or Cyberboard, which is a, a much older uh, type of, of uh, program, are very good for playtesting uh, because you can put together a module um, with the prototypes of your map, counters, and so forth. And it's much easier to send uh, this kind of file to your playtesters over the internet as opposed to making physical playtest kits, which is a tremendous pain. Um, and of course, if you send items out to 20 different play testers and you never hear back from 17 of them, well, then that hurts a lot less than if you've made 20 play test kits and 17 of them are wasted. Um, and of course, there's some examples here of browser-based or web-based games uh, like Roll20 mm -hmm. or Tabletop Simulator, uh, which again uh, are just uh, uh, you know, they can get, again, this is a digital port of your board game. Some of them might involve uh, having to know a little bit of coding or knowledge of the software in order to have a satisfactory version of the game. But an example of just how low tech even this can get is simply using Google Slides. Um, if you use Google Slides, for example, the base layer of the slide would be, uh, the first slide would be the map. The counters are manipulable objects that move around on top of that. Uh, meanwhile, you can have text boxes on top of the map that can be updated with information and so on. And because it's a Google Slides, you can have any number of players using it at the same time. The players can chat or message each other uh, with uh, using other software while playing and rolling dice to, to resolve the actions on the map. And when you're done a game turn, what you do is you just duplicate the slide. And that sets you up for the next turn um, in, in the game, but it also keeps a record of the game as it's played turn by turn. And finally, here are some software choices for text-based games and interactive fiction. Um, there's many similar programs available. A lot of them have been created for teachers and uh, instructors to use, and they don't require knowledge of any kind of programming language or experience of coding. And, you know, in, in the extreme, um, as opposed to these purpose-built programs, you could really use uh, any kind of HTML editor uh, to create a text-based game. Hypertext permitted the internet to exist in the first place. So any HTML editor that you use to build a website can be used to make potentially an absorbing piece of interactive fiction because at the bottom of it, the entire web is hypertext. Now, we've talked about why, what, and how to self-publish. We've talked about text and graphics and how they go together to make game components and things to keep in mind when creating them. And we've talked about methods of production and distribution. Again, print and play, print on demand, or digital self-publishing. So um, good luck to you in any kind of game-related project that you have in mind. And just remember, one more time, Dunnigan's two basic rules. Keep it simple and plagiarize. Thank you. Oh, and just uh, take a moment to scribble down that URL if you want to have a look at uh, the, the slide deck uh, and download a, a copy for yourself. Okay, um, how do we get out of share screen? Escape? There we go. Stop share. Thanks, Grant. No, thank you. I mean, that was that was great. I, I don't know if you were able to take a peek at the um, 
the chat, but uh, I will no, say- No, I wasn't. No, that's totally fine. A lot of people are very engaged, so I, so I big thank you to all the, um, all the attendees tonight. Um, uh, so I have a couple questions, if that's all right mm. with you. Um, so, so one, sorry, I've got them in a separate doc here. Um, one, I thought, I thought a good question was by Maurice, who said, uh, Brian, with your impressive track record and industry stature as a whole, there must be a few publishers, big or small, who wouldn't be interested in your designs. So what's the draw of self-publication for you? Maurice, he's trying to butter me up, I think. Well, um, as I mentioned, I have half a dozen designs that I made available through um, BTR games. That's my... Uh, sort of DTP imprint. Um, and the uh, there there's about half a dozen there and then there's another half dozen that I made a, make available for free uh, on my website as well. So that's a dozen designs. These are things that um, I'm no publisher is really interested that much in picking up. Um, I used to have more of these BTR games available uh, as DTP products. Uh, but they would be picked up. Uh, One Small Step Games, for example, they picked up several of my titles that were previously things I did myself, I self-published, and um, put it together as a folio and uh, made that available for, um, you know, with some nicer artwork. Um, hold on, someone's asked me to, uh, uh, okay, let me just copy this. Um, so basically, uh, the ones that I have available are, they're ones that aren't, um, there we go. They're ones that aren't uh, uh, really, I think they're not all that saleable or they're too small, you know, like there are small abstract games and things like that, that uh, nobody would really be interested in publishing. So, you know, I came out of the DTP ghetto and I'm still there in a way. Uh, and I think uh, for as long as I still put games together, I work on topics that interest me. Um, as I said, you don't make any coin at this uh, or very little coin. Uh, so you might as well please yourself. And uh, pleasing yourself is uh, a good way, you know, and you, you self-publish it. And uh, other people get to know just how you pleasure yourself. Oh, there we are. Oh, perfect. Okay. So, so I know Tim was having a, some trouble with the link. Tim, if that doesn't work, just let me know and I'll, um, I'll find the right link. Um, yeah, that should work. Yeah, it, that, that, it was right. working for me at least, so yeah. fingers okay. crossed. Um, yeah. No, I, I published it just before uh, it came up and I tested that it works. So anyway, okay. Perfect. Um, and so, so I know we had one from, uh, this is earlier in the presentation. I know a few people in the comments had, had given suggestions. So um, this is from uh, Jim, Jim I uh, De Croco may not have pronounced mm -hmm. that correctly. But um, he said, hi, Brian, uh, I'm not a computer whiz. That's okay, me too, Jim. Uh -huh. um, however, I would enjoy building variant counters in some of my games, despite the list of uh, programs, and frankly, don't know how to start. Um, so would you suggest using the templates of Redmond A. Simonson that uh, you had listed on one of the earlier slides, or do you have kind of other suggestions? Hold on, I think I found the problem. Uh, it's not 06, it's 08. This one's good too. Sorry about that. There we go. That link should work. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's, uh, it's you know, I, I really like Redmond Simonson's work. Uh, I think he's a really good person to, to imitate. Uh, I think, you know, personally, and I'm really old school about this, I, I think that uh, war game visual design really kind of reached a high point with him in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, we have much better technology now and we can be much more subtle, but the ideas that he had for simple, clear design, uh, I think in our ones, they're, I think they're, they're good points for anybody to start with. And, it, you, in a, and if you're comfortable, you know, staying that way, that's fine. Uh, but designers will find their own, you know, you'll find your own particular swing of things. You'll find uh, there are particular um, methods of putting text and image together or certain styles that uh, just work it better for you. Because when you're a designer, it's, I mean, you are a form of artist, you know, a, a game is a creative product. Uh, and it's up to you to find what works for you best 
but just remember, you know, there, as I said, there's very few things that are, you know, really original. There's really very little that's new under the sun. And at the very least, it's really good to see the kind of mistakes that other people have made um, so that you don't make them either. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think that I think that was helpful. I, I know also um, you had mentioned on a later slide, but um, a few people in the comments mentioned Tom Mo Moat Moat. Yes, uh, as that's a right. Really good resource. Um, yes. Uh, so so next question, we've got kind of a, a, a multi-parter from uh, Regimental Commander, mm -hmm. um, which was. Uh, so how much how much does the printing or distribution that you plan to use affect the design decisions? So for instance, most folks during a print to play at home aren't printing anything bigger than your kind of normal eight and a half by 14 inch paper. So does that impact how you design your maps? As in, do you try and kind oh. of stick with these counters that you know people have at home? Or do you kind of create the game and then say, well, you know, let let people at home with their printers kind of figure out how it's how it's supposed to go the former absolutely the former um i am a cheap bastard if i were getting a pdf of somebody else's game uh and it cost me like three cartridges of ink to print the thing out um i i wouldn't really like that um i am really cheap because i i produce my own prototypes as i go along so i'm really um, miserly with ink <laughs> and of course paper paper sizes uh, you have to respect those that's a habit that I acquired from the very beginning I mentioned the microgame co-op uh, which we later called the microgame design group uh, funny story won't go into it there um, but uh, the restrictions that we had then is that the material as a DTP product had to be produced on a home printer uh, so we were restricted to one sheet, a uh, letter size sheet of counters. Uh, of course, they could be any size, shape, color we wanted, but you had one sheet of, of, uh, of counters to, to make up, uh, an, an 11 by 17 map. Uh, and uh, well, you could make the rules as long as you wanted, but uh, with those physical parameters for the map and counters, most games were around, you know, maybe six to eight pages of rules and a couple of uh, page or two of charts. Um, and that was a small, cheap and cheerful product. And as I said, we turned out 40 titles like that. But what was really valuable to me doing that was the discipline that it imposed on you. Um, a beginning, if you're a writer and you're beginning, you probably don't wanna, well, a lot of them start in and saying, oh, well, I'm gonna start with a 100,000 word novel and work backward from there. Um, it's better to work, uh, to work small to begin with. Uh, because just the discipline of having certain physical parameters that you have to respect uh, confers a kind of discipline on, you know, for example, the number and type of counters or units that you can put into the game. Uh, if you know that you have only so much, uh, so large a canvas to work from on the map, uh, then that makes you think more carefully about how your map is laid out, how much of your map is really used during the game you know, and just trying to maximize things as much as possible. So I think it's a good efficiency exercise. It's, it's good, um, it's good discipline. And I see Regimental Commander mentioned HyperCard, which I was going to mention as well. Uh, but it's something that maybe only a few people here remember. Um, okay, great. So we've got, uh, I've got Three more questions. I don't know if that's we may we may get a few more, and that's totally fine. Um, sure. We, I mean, we've got another three quarters of an hour. I'm yeah. We we're, we're we're set on on time. Um, yeah. So I, uh, Santiago had asked, in your opinion, how large is the existing war game market? Um, and do you think, I mean, maybe with COVID that it's expanded, or maybe it's kind of saturated? Well, um, I, I guess it's. You're, you're, you're talking about the board war game market, like the market for manual war games, because um, there are far, far more copies of the worst computer war game ever designed. I don't know which would be a candidate for that, but I'll guarantee you that far, far more copies of that game were sold uh, than, you know, the best selling board war game which uh, of all time, which I think is, well, it used to be Panzer Blitz, 
um, but I think maybe Twilight Struggle, uh, which I happen to think is a war game. Uh, people might differ on that. Um, but anyway, the, the, you, you've got a couple hundred thousand copies of those uh, in people's hands, uh, but that's over you know, a fairly long run of time. Um, it's anybody's guess just how many really devoted um, board war gamers there are out there. Um, I would say, I don't know, I guess maybe 10,000, most of them Americans. Uh, but I know that I'm almost certainly wrong with that number. It's, uh, it's hard to tell because there are people who have different layers uh, or depths of involvement with board war games. There are a lot of people, you know, who um, level off with, you know, Axis and Allies of some flavor. Um, and then there are people who like dove right into it, you know, in the 70s and haven't come out of the pool since. Uh, you know, as I said, I've been playing since 78 or 79, um, and I have never taken any kind of hiatus in playing or, or interest in, in, in board war games. But it was quite a while before I, you know, got it together to start designing my own stuff. That's actually a good, a good point, just talking about kind of the, the different levels at which uh, designers and, and players are at. So uh, uh, Thomas Velot, apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, um, had said you talked a lot about the process and options for release, but um, what do you do about marketing, right? So how does someone who doesn't have um, a reputation get noticed? Uh, be patient. <laughs> I... Um... I've really, um, I really haven't made much effort to advertise any of, of my designs. Um, like, a, like I started designing in 1990 or so. My first DTP designs came out with Microgame Co-op in 1994, 95. Uh, but it wasn't until, uh, it wasn't until like maybe 10 years ago that I think I started to get any kind of a, a reputation or to become a, any kind of a name among nerds. Um, it's, uh, for me, it never really mattered um, because for me, it was kind of a, it was a hobby that, that I was interested in and I wanted to share my work and it was pleasant to share my work with other people. Uh, and so with the microgame design group, um, we never really went out of our way to advertise at all. We were active on Console World Expo uh, and Board Game Geek later, you know, in kind of uh, you know, just advertising our, our presence. Uh, but really, it was mostly word of mouth, you know, just uh, you started printing copies and people would pick them up. Um, to market yourself, I think uh, there are more routes nowadays than there were, you know, 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, Board Game Geek, of course, is uh, much more larger and, and, you know, more functional than it was. Um, and uh, outfits like War Game Vault, that's a cheap way to, uh, to get your work seen uh, and distributed around. Um, I'd say just kind of participate in things. Um, but uh, like a formal marketing plan or to spend money or, or genuine effort on, on marketing yourself and your games to try and s actively sell them to people. I'm sorry, but I never did a, a, a lot of that. Right, and um, we had another question with, uh, from, from Alan Richberg, uh, who had asked, uh, do you ever work with a developer? And to the extent that you have, what has, has your been experience working with developers? Well, um... I have worked a few times with a developer. There's different schools of thought as to uh, what a developer's job is. Um, my, a friend of mine, Neil Durando, uh, wrote a really brilliant series of articles uh, in his blog a, a few years ago um, about different um, styles of, or schools of thought that different companies uh, brought to the, the job of a developer. Um, I think it's the designer's job to create uh, a game and to play it and work it out and develop it himself or herself to the point where they would be happy putting it out as a self-published project. Uh, and if you, get, if you get it to that point, 
and you're serious about submitting it to the attention of a bigger company uh, and going bigger, um, then be an, you, you should anticipate working with a developer. Um, I have worked with a few developers. Uh, some experiences were better than others. Uh, the main thing as it is in any and every relationship is communication both ways. Uh, don't, neither party should leave the other party in the dark about anything. Um, so if you don't, I mean, if someone just kind of grabs something and then just, you know, goes away, runs away with it. And uh, that's, I, I don't think that's a very good working relationship. And I don't think that's very respectful of the designer as the original creator. Uh, you really, to, to my way of thinking, you're a team, the designer and developer are a team and they have different functions within that team um, and in how they relate to play testers and production staff and that kind of thing, depending on you know, the company that you're working with. Um, but really they have to work together to, to, bring, to bring the design to another level um, of, of, uh, of, of graphic and, and mechanical sophistication, put it that way. Great, thank you. We've um, we got two left. Uh, so uh, one's from Jeff Beeler, who had asked, um, are there any, currently any groups like Micro Game Design Group that are still around these days? Well, um, Micro Game Design Group kind of, uh, well, Carrie Anderson and I, we started it. Uh, Carrie uh, shut it down a, a while back because he wanted to go back to school and uh, get his doctorate. Uh, but he has opened it up again uh, for limited production, mostly of his own titles. Uh, but Jeffries, your, your, your question is about, um, is there somebody who, sorry, like a publishing company that will, um, is looking to take uh, designs by unknown people and put them out? Uh, I'd be hard put to name anybody like that. Um, because again, here we are 25 years later, you know, from the original founding of, um, of the micro game design group and things have changed. Um, people have more, uh, roots to publish things themselves, um, and, and learn that way. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say there are lots of small press outfits, uh, but people who are willing to take on somebody who has never published or designed any kind of game before, I think they might be a little cautious about that. So again, uh, starting work by yourself on what pleases you, uh, getting it to a stage that pleases you, uh, that you feel confident in distributing it to other people just to see what they would say um, and to try and build your reputation. That would be kind of the way that you'd have to start. And you have to kind of, I guess, sort of not, not win your spurs actually, but kind of like go out in the backyard and forge them yourself. That's good. We'll add uh, amateur blacksmith yeah. to the role. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, and I see, yeah. And I see Brandt has, has posted some good comments here on professional publishers and, uh, and on marketing. Good thoughts, Brandt. Um, we got another question from, from Mark Flanagan who had asked, do you find that um, coin games were a hard game or a hard game to explain to more traditional war, war gamers? To some of them, yes. Um, I even, even now, I, you know, 10 years after the publication of the first coin system game on Day and Abyss, uh, I'll still run into people posting online about how they don't consider uh, the coin system games war games at all because they use little wooden bits. Um, I think that that kind of misses the point. I, I mean, instead of the wooden bits, we could have just had counters with some random numbers and images on them. And, uh, you know, maybe that might have pleased them and convinced them that it was a war game. Um, they're political military games. They're games that mimic a lot of what they call non kind of non non kinetic action uh, so and and the abs and, and the action is abstracted at a very high level uh, so it's um, it's it's if, if you're if, if you're like a, a standard war gamer 
you know, like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're like a naval war gamer at heart or something like that, or you're, you like tactical games. It may not really resonate with you uh, in comparison to the kind of games that you normally play and, uh, and, and enjoy playing because it doesn't go into that level of detail that you would find satisfying. Um, and the asymmetry uh, between the factions, whether it's two, three, four, I think we're working on five and six faction coin games now, uh, is something that uh, some people may find uh, a little hard. It, 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 like some people say, well, it's like having to learn four different games at once because you've got four different people playing through the conflict in four different ways. That kind of is the point. But right. again, you know, it, it, it doesn't satisfy everyone. And, you know, fair enough. If you don't like coin system games, I'm not going to plead with you. Um, it's, uh, it's something you enjoy or you don't enjoy. I mean, this is something that, you know, we're all engaged in this uh, to enjoy it and to learn something. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be, want to be the one to dictate to people. And I think you kind of touched on this in that question, but um, Santiago had asked, in your opinion, is the, the physical quality of the chits board a, a decisive factor for gamers buying into a game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I was talking about, Redmond Simonson talking about uh, it, you know, be, because the graphics of a game uh, that you put together is the information retrieval system. You know, I mean, the, the, the rules are the information, you have to retrieve information from them, but the, the map and the counters, the player, player aids and uh, charts and tables and how they're laid out, um, that's the physical, that's the symbolic information retrieval system. It has to be something that's easy to use. It's not too fiddly. It's not unpleasant to look at for long periods of time. Uh, it's, it's really important. So presentation of a game is really important. Uh, but presentation doesn't stop with like pleasing colors or miniatures or something like that. Um, it's something that a graphic designer has to understand and appreciate. And it ha it, the two of them has, have, to, have to work together. And as I said, Redmond Simonson was the first professional graphic designer to get into this field. Uh, and that's why his work is a good place to start from. Great. So we've got, I believe we're on our last question. So this is maybe a, a good time to say, so uh, this, the whole presentation, the Q&A will be on the Georgetown University Wargaming Society uh, YouTube link. Um, so if you maybe had came in a little bit, a little bit late or for, I suppose it's a little bit late, but for anyone who had to leave early, um, this will be here uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, and we also, uh, Brian earlier in the chat posted uh, where all the slides can be found. Um, so we had a, a, another question from Brant who said, uh, how often do you start with an interesting conflict and try to figure out the best way to model it versus starting with a, an interesting mechanic and then trying to find a conflict that you can apply it to? Well, the answer is some of each. <laughs> I've done both. Uh, I've done games on topics that nobody else has ever touched, you know, like the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, I mentioned one of my first designs was on uh, extremist uh, violent and, and political violence in the United States in the Great Depression. Um, so I would find a conflict and then I would think about ways, you know, to model it, yes. Uh, and through that, I've created, um, I don't know, I, I, I've published over 50 designs, 50 or 60, and maybe about half of them belong to, in, in terms of mechanics, they belong to one family or another that I've put together. So for example, I had a series of four or five games that I call kind of the Between the Wars series. And there, uh, a, that was a series of, of operational scale games on um, of battles uh, between World War I or World War II. So like the Russo-Polish War, uh, an American invasion of Canada in the late 1930s, the Finnish Civil War of 1918, things like that. They had a common system, but you changed uh, up the, the, the particular parameters of each. So it was a, a particular system that I developed over the course of designing several games. 
Um, but I would come up, uh, you know, with a conflict and I think, oh, yeah, okay, that's an interesting conflict. I'd be interested in researching that. And this system would probably be a good fit for that. Uh, but sometimes I would put together like a, a new system for something. I mean, every system has to have it start somewhere. And that's half of my work. The other half of my work, you know, 20 or 30 designs, uh, use sets of mechanics that I have never used uh, from, you know, I, I never used it if for any other game before, and I never used it for anyone after. So I like experimenting. I like experimenting with unusual topics uh, and uh, with unusual mechanics. Doesn't always work, um, but that's, uh, that's how we do it. And sometimes, yes, there is a, there's a mechanic, and I'll try to find a conflict for it. Um, Jim mentioned a Battle of the Bulge game down there. That's how my Battle of the Bulge game came to be. Uh, because uh, I had developed a, a core and army system uh, that uh, featured, you know, almost diceless combat and uh, kind of a mission matrix idea and uh, a sort of an HQ activation system between the two of them. Those things are kind of common now, but this is back in like 2000 or so, like 20 years ago, when it was still a little unusual. And I wanted to, uh, I was thinking of developing that and using it for a Manchuria 1945 campaign game, because uh, at that point, nobody had done anything like that. As it turned out, I got diverted uh, because with the design group, we were approached by a Spanish magazine that wanted to publish war games in it, in, in its, uh, in its pages. And um, they kind of wanted to start with the big five, you know, Gettysburg, Normandy, Waterloo, and of course the Bulge. And the deal fell through, you know, I, I don't even know what the magazine was called. I don't think it ever published at all. But here I was left with uh, a bulge game using this particular system. And I thought, well, it works fine, you know? So sometimes, yes, a mechanic looks for a conflict and sometimes I would think more often I have conflicts that look for mechanics. And before, I know we had a, a, a Ilium had a question uh, related to that. Just a, a real ah. quick one from, from Joe who had asked, um, do you know, is that uh, Seattle Black Block WTO game, is that on the, the on your website? Yes, if you go to my website, uh, uh, it, there's a page called Free Games, and there's half a dozen games there, and they're all PDFs or whatever, and uh, you just download them. But yeah, the Battle of Seattle game is there. Thank you, Joe. Um, Ilium, uh, my own perspective or bias, as opposed to objective. Well, you know, uh, I said earlier, game designers are artists, uh, in the sense that writers are artists, painters are artists, sculptors are artists. No painter, writer, sculptor, game designer ever produces an item that is completely objective or neutral. Um, it's impossible. It's impossible to have any kind of, of creative, you know, artificial object that doesn't have the spirit or experience of, uh, of its creator in it somewhere. Um, that sounds pretentious, I'm sorry. Um, but when you're doing research and you're presenting it in the form of a book uh, or a game or something like that, yes, you have to, you have to exercise certain choices as to what you know, like, well, first of all, you have to kind of draw a limit as to, you, you have to say enough at some point for research. Like, yes, you can be like Danny Parker and, and spend 30 years, you know, researching just the Battle of the Bulge, the, the, the campaign, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and he's produced different games, you know, in over the course of his design career. Uh, but at some point, you kind of have to say, okay, well, look, this is enough. I, I, I now know enough about this uh in order to move myself into a position where i can present what i think is a convincing picture of the action or my interpretation of the action uh in game form and uh yes your experience is going to kind of color that um so when you're speaking about perspective or bias i don't know if you're speaking of political bias as such or just the bias that you feel you may have because you haven't read every existing word on a topic. Uh, and I'm, 
I'm not even sure that if you could read every existing word on a topic that you could come out with an objective presentation of the action. If there would be something there that you could make a synopsis of it that would be intelligible to somebody else who hadn't spent as much time as you reading on it. It's a distillation of your research. It's a distillation of your experience. It's, it's a distillation of what you want to put across in your game design. Um, and yeah, that's got some of you in it. Can't help it. Great. So I, I think we're all done with questions. If, if I missed a question, please do let me know. Um, but uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Brian. Really great presentation and also really great participation with a lot of people uh, in the chat below, sending helpful links. Um, so, so a huge thank you. Um, and uh, like I said, this will be uh, recording it will be on YouTube. So if there's any uh, part you wanted to rehash, feel free to watch it on the Georgetown University Wargaming Society um, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and beyond that, again, uh, Brian and all of his works we put on the website in the chat. Um, getting a lot of thank yous from the uh, chat to you, Brian. So uh, thank you again. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, uh, but I will leave the meeting open for just a minute or two in case anyone wanted to go through the chat, find a, one of the helpful links. Thanks for coming, everyone. I really enjoyed this. And, you know, as I said, I really, I learned in the course of putting together stuff for this presentation. I got a lot to learn. We all do. <laughs>